Thank you all for turning up uh, to, well, the first proper Startup Grind event in Perth. There was a pop-up event run about 18 months ago with Andre Ekmeyer uh, from Vino Mopo. Did anyone go to that? All newbies. Freshies. Fantastic. So before this, who actually knew about um, uh, Startup Grind? Who'd heard about it? Couple? A few? Okay. Um, so Startup Grind's a, a global startup organisation. Um, it's run by those three values uh, uh, on the left-hand side, or your right-hand side, um, which is one of the things that I first uh, loved about it. it was, it's all about give first, uh, don't take, make friends, not contacts, uh, and help others before yourself. How I got introduced to it, I was in Sydney once on a trip, and I was going down to Melbourne, and somebody said to me, if you're going down to Melbourne, you need to go to Startup Grind. Um, and it was with, I've forgotten his name, uh, the founder of Vend, uh, out of New Zealand. Um, about the same size as this, uh, in the NAB building uh, in the Docklands, and it was just it, it was just magic. It was different, right? It was exciting. And so when I came back, uh, the Startup Grind people kept saying, mm. we want you to do it in Perth, Andy. We want you to do it in Perth. And I didn't have time, and I couldn't uh, uh, focus on it, and kind of parked it. <clears throat> and then uh, the middle of last year, a few things started to collide. So... Um, some people started saying to me, uh, have you heard of this lady called Gemma Green? And I said, I have. I said, but I don't know her. And I said, okay, all right. So I jumped onto LinkedIn, my CRM system. I introduced myself to Gemma. And I said, hey Gemma, uh, you know, it's Andy. Uh, at the time I was running a company called Atomic Sky. Um, it'd be great to catch up with you. Hi Andy, da 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 uh, Love to, we'll see how we go. Then somebody got really busy. <laughs> <laughs> then Power Ledger came along and uh, raised Australia's first ICO. Someone got even busier as well. Um, and I remember I was on a plane to Adelaide uh, for some work I was doing with CSIRO. And I'm sitting in my seat, it's late at nine, and I'm sort of half, I don't know, awake and not awake. And I see this lady sit down in front of me the daughter and I'm like, I know that person, I know that person. And I'm sitting there and I'm trying to rack my brain and the plane took off, so I didn't have any Wi-Fi and then I landed and I jumped into my CRM system, LinkedIn again, and I went, oh, it's Gemma. Right, when we start, I'm gonna say hello and seize the opportunity. And then she was working, working, dealing with the daughter. And so there was no way I was going to do that. So I was like, oh man, I missed my opportunity again. So I got back to the hotel jumped into, hey Gemma, was that you on the plane? <laughs> <laughs> yes. I think you were over to, for the power, or the astronaut thing that was on at um, the space agency thing at Adelaide? At oh time. yeah, actually for the launch of the big battery. That was it, yeah. Um, yep, be great to catch up. Have you got time? We might see you down there. Uh, no, I'm running a session with CSIRO. Cool, let's do it again. So then West Tech Fest came up. Let's try and catch up in between everything else at West Tech Fest. That was cool. So with all the craziness that that is of trying to catch up in, in between as well, and then at the time Gemma was also the deputy Lord Mayor, then the acting Lord Mayor. Not very good with my official titles. Yeah, so, um, and I was like, oh man, I missed the opportunity again. And around about the same time, the guys from Startup Grind went, Andy, we really want you to get this going in Perth. And I went, Here's my opportunity. So I sat down and went, right, what do we need to do? And part of the application is you have to um, sit down and think about three or four people that are going to fill your first three or four sessions. And I went, I know someone that people will love. Right? It's also different to what we've done in the startup community uh, in Perth as well. Uh, and so it all kind of came together. So I reached out to Gemma, and she was very, very kind to go, yes, I'd love to. So I was like, I'm in. Right, we're done. So the guy from Startup Grind in Sydney was like, mate, leave it to me. We'll just tick the box. Everything will be cool. No issues. So I wait for a day. Andy, really sorry. There's no shortcuts. You've got to fill in the application form. <sighs> so I jump online, fill it in, sort everything out. Uh, we went through Christmas, the new year. Um, and then we started talking. We picked a date, I think. And then EY came along as well. Uh, wherever... 
It's Kate still. Hey, there's Kate. Um, Thank you. Um, <laughs> um, and so EY, we, we'd love to actually uh, work with you with Startup Grind. So we went, great. The date we've got is the 16th. We all kind of locked it in. And then Gemma came back and said, oh, it'd be really good if we did a lunchtime session. And I went, actually, you know what, that's not a bad idea. But I might have to find out if there's any rules. I don't want to break any rules with Startup Grind. I don't want to get a speeding ticket before I've even started. Mm -hmm. um, and they went, no, nah, start, great. They work really, really well, as we can see today. Um, go for it. So I went back to Kate and went, cool, we're on for the 16th at lunchtime. Today is Chinese New Year. <laughs> so it was like, <sighs> so we, then we went through, but then this space was coming up. So Tank Stream Labs, um, who are also a co-sponsor, are opening up a co-working space here as well. Um, and, uh, and so we said we could have it down here. So that's why we're all kind of cramped in down here. So the final bit of the puzzle was that then when we had this, all the tick was done, everything as you, as you folks know is, it's all done through the Startup Grind website, which is great. And yet I had no permissions to create a new event and actually promote it and send it out in the first week. So then it got through to the second week and it was like, <gasps> What are we going to do? How are we going to do this? We've only got two weeks to go. There might be 20 people here, so we'll all be eating lots of food. Um, and we sold out in eight days, which is fantastic, which I think has a lot to do with this lady sitting on my left. Did I mention you? I've got to go now. I've run out of time. <laughs> <laughs> so all of that story leads us to... <laughs> Is that one of these? One? <laughs> So the reason it's called Startup Grind is because it's a grind, okay? And really getting this going has been a grind, but it's been fantastic that we're here, all right? So with that, uh, I will, uh, I'm going to turn this off so that we're not uh, focused on it. There we go. Um, I would love you to welcome Dr. Gemma Green as our first official Perth Startup Grind guest. Thank you. Thank you. Now, I was also going to put an L plate on as well, because it's my first one, but, so take it easy. And I've got notes, I don't do notes normally. You can actually see it on the map. Every other dot is big and the first dot is tiny. Anyone want a pen? Uh, it is, I've put that on before. So, so again, like the t-shirts, you get all the artwork and everything, and then when someone went Perth and they forgot to put Perth on. So, so Gemma, can we go back, really, where we start, I guess? to talk a bit about your journey. So when you came out of school, um, uh, what did you choose to do? What were you interested in? And kind of where did you end up first? I, I didn't really know what I wanted to do like career-wise till I was 27. And uh, before that, I, I just was kind of, I'll do this because I don't really know what else to do. And I, I was born and raised in the Perth Hills and went to Eastern Hill Senior High School and then I did a business degree at Murdoch. I did that basically because I thought, oh, it's a you know, good basic degree to have. And uh, I finished that and then I went travelling and my dad's Irish, so I've got a British passport and I was able to live and work in the UK. And with a business degree majoring in finance, you kind of fall into banking. <laughs> and so, yeah, it was kind of by accident that I started working in banking and I really didn't like it that much. Uh, and then when I'd been at JP Morgan, I think for about three years, I did a training course and as a part of that, I had to choose a project, anything that I wanted to do. And I looked around our London offices and saw that there was no recycling facilities and I thought, oh, maybe I can introduce recycling. And so I went about figuring out how much money we were spending on sending rubbish to landfill and cleaners emptying there's like 9,000 people in the six London buildings. So there's 9,000 individual bins at everyone's desk, 9,000 bin liners. And I figured out that we could put recycling bins at the ends of the aisle of desks and save about a half a million pounds a year. And I quite audaciously at the time, because I was very junior, called the chief operating officer for JP Morgan Europe <laughs> and said, could I have 10 minutes of your time? And he said, yes. Cool. And so I went and spoke to him and said, hey, we can save half a million pounds by putting in recycling because it's cheaper to send waste to recycling than it was to landfill. And he said, that's a great idea, let's do it. And three months later, we had these recycling bins in the offices 
Uh, and I was so excited until I saw people throwing their recycling into their little rubbish bin at their desk. And I thought, oh, this project needs a part two, and it's called Bin the Bin. And I basically calculated that if you got rid of the 9,000 bins and instead put 1,000 large bins at the end of the aisle, um, you could uh, increase the rate of recycling because people had to walk regardless of whether it was recycling or, or not. And we could save another half a million pounds a year because you weren't replacing 9,000 bin liners a day, you were 1,000, and that was 1,000 times a day the cleaner had to empty the bins as opposed to 9,000. <laughs> and um, so I went back to the COO and told him this, and he said, great, let's do it. And three months later, we rolled out this binless office program, and I became the most hated person <laughs> uh, at JP Morgan in London. And so much so that people started a Facebook page called Bring the Bins Back. And, <laughs> and I was blamed for rats in the office um, because people were leaving their rubbish at their desk rather than walking to the bin. And then we said, well, they said that people were saying things like, I'm so busy making money for the bank, I don't have time to walk to um, the bin. And then we said, all right, we'll put them on the way to the toilet. And they would say, I'm so busy making money for the bank, I don't have time to walk to the toilet. And I mean, that's the kind of definition of unsustainability <laughs> when you can't take care of your own bodily functions. But uh, fortunately, the, the COO, he said, they would not behave like this at home, the system staying. And um, I was so fascinated by this sort of very strong reaction from some people. Others were very much in support of it, but I thought this is way more interesting than my day job. I want to work in this field, and um, I didn't really have any formal training in it, so I applied to do a postgraduate uh, certificate in sustainability at Cambridge University, and I was halfway through doing that course when JP Morgan basically decided to set up um, a global environmental and social risk management function, which is basically looking at its lending in developing countries from an environmental and social uh, risk perspective. and because of my little bin project and my um, studies, I was chosen to help set up the team. Uh, and I worked in the team for six years, and then in the last two years I ended up running it. Um, but it was uh, kind of at that moment that I went, oh, this is a field that I'm very passionate and interested in. And I looked at, in that job, I looked at mining and oil and gas sectors and power, and um, also real estate. And I thought energy is very interesting uh, to me, and as is real estate, I thought they were areas that had a big impact. And um, I went on to do a master's whilst working there full time, and I was pretty tired when I, by the time I submitted my thesis in 2012. So I took a sabbatical of 12 months from JP Morgan and I went backpacking. And uh, I started hiking. I did the Camino de Santiago, and then I did some hiking in Israel and um, Nepal. South America and all these ideas kind of popped into my head while I was hiking and uh, I thought I really want to build an eco village and um, I eventually wrote an email and shared this idea with a friend of mine who is a professor in Europe and he said oh you should reach out to Professor Peter Newman in Perth because uh, I said I wanted to come home and uh, speak to him so I, I wrote him an email and said look I'm a returning Western Australian this is my background and want to build an eco village and he wrote back saying that's a great idea we should do it in Fremantle and copied in the mayor of Fremantle uh, to the email and on my return back to Perth at the end of 2012 I had lunch set up with the mayor and we were thinking about what where a project might be located and then Peter persuaded me that it would be a good PhD to do <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah it was kind of by accident like through not knowing what I wanted to do, but pursuing things that I was perhaps interested in, that I discovered what I was really passionate about, which was the field of sustainability, and then I've kind of honed it down to energy, uh, but working in the built environment still. And um, yeah, and then Power Ledger was a bit of an accident, well, it was a complete accident. Basically, in my PhD, I designed a solar and battery system for an apartment building, because in Australia, we have about 22% of households with rooftop solar on houses, but hardly any in apartment buildings. And apartment buildings are about 32% of the housing stock. And there's a few reasons why that we haven't got much, you know, by way of renewables in uh, that part of the housing sector. And it's because it's more complex to build a shared system. 
but the laws that govern these building strata actually allows for the strata to be a retailer of electricity without having a retail electricity license. And so I saw this in my research and went, oh, that's pretty cool. They could actually um, facilitate a shared trading system uh, mm -hmm. within the apartment building. But then I was trying to find software that could allocate electricity to each apartment. And if you weren't home to consume your allocation, you could trade that with your neighbours. And I couldn't find anything that did that. And uh, back in January of 2016, I. I just had a baby about a month earlier. A former JP Morgan colleague of mine from Sydney uh, introduced me to two blockchain developers and I'd really only heard notionally about the blockchain at that point in terms of Bitcoin. But I started looking online and went, ooh, it can do exactly what I had hoped in this building. And I introduced them to uh, Dave Martin and Jenny Conway, two other founders of Powerledger who've worked in energy markets for like two decades. and. Dave got very excited and saw that, that it could do exactly the same thing but in a regulated electricity market, so across the regulated network. And he actually said, I want to start, <coughs> set up a company, do you want to join me? And I yeah. said, yeah, for sure. So like in May of that year, May of 2016, we formed PowerLedger with those two products in mind, peer-to-peer -peer trading within yep. buildings and peer-to-peer -peer trading across regulated networks. So yeah, it was a kind of mixture of like pursuing my interests rather than actually, you know, mm. I mean, blockchain wasn't even contemplated when I was making my first career decisions. <laughs> <laughs> Me either. <laughs> um, so that sort of the tenacity and the, you know, the, the focus on the problem, were you always like that? Or did that come out of a bit of the environment of working in, you know, a trading organisation like JP Morgan? Uh, I mean, I certainly, I mean, I didn't like the first part of my career at the time, but now the skills mm -hmm. that I, I, I've learned in that period of my life are enormously valuable and I draw upon them every day mm -hmm. in the work that I do. But I think, I think I got that kind of side of myself from my dad um, and it was probably, belligerence was probably from <laughs> book <birth. laughs> So, I mean, it was interesting. One of the things I, I guess that we talk about in the startup community a lot is start with the problem. Um, and far too many people start with the product and the solution. Um, so what do you think really, how did you actually, was it just the interest in what you did where you started trying to understand the problem more and more and more before you started looking for the solution? Yeah, I think I was looking at that you know there were announcements being made I think around 2011 by Bloomberg New Energy Finance that the cost of new wind was cheaper than co new coal and you could see that uh, households were installing renewables but there wasn't a revolution happening mm. and I was kind of going why what's going on why is that and I think the other thing I saw was that there was a lack of sophistication in electricity markets like if you are a market participant like you're a, you've got a power station and you generate electricity, you don't get paid for that for two and a half months. Mm. And so you need a big balance sheet, like you need a big um, credit facility from your bank to pay all your bills till you get paid for the electricity. And only big market participants can really play in the space, whereas it's about as sophisticated to, you know, to allow you and I to trade electricity as a supermarket is to buy homegrown tomatoes. And what I saw was that the blockchain allowed a level of sophistication to allow households in aggregate to solve some of the big problems, like they could provide their battery sourced electricity to the grid in the peak, mm. rather than having standby coal-fired power stations or gas-fired power stations to do that. And that the blockchain would enable that more bona fide marketplace. And that also the way the blockchain works is that as the electricity moves across the network, that the entries in, on the meters creates the payment. So the payment happens instantaneously mm. as the electricity is generated. So you get paid, uh, and that's a very efficient marketplace. Mm. And so I saw that it could provide sophistication and efficiency to the marketplace um, that was really in need of reform because we've had pretty much the same electricity system for a century with big power stations, transmission lines, distribution lines, bringing electricity to our homes and businesses. And in the past 10 years, we've seen this new system emerging of distributed electricity but it, it can't reach its full potential unless we have enabling technologies like the blockchain that are really going to create that level of sophistication to make 
a market that is a combination of centralised and distributed work. Cool. So you took on the powers that be at JP Morgan with your little BIM project, and then you've decided to take on a big incumbent industry as well. Yeah. Um, why? What drives you? Well, I don't think about it as taking it on. I actually see it as working in partnership. Uh, the, the electricity market's undergoing disruption regardless of power ledger. And the, the incumbent participants are very well aware of that. And my PhD was actually looking at disruptive innovation, looking at electricity markets. And incumbent players can do one or a combination of three things when they can see that their profit margin uh, and their market share is being eroded. They can fight, they can flight or innovate. And what that means, fight is, in the case of electricity, like uh, fighting against the renewable energy target, fighting to <coughs> stop people being able to connect solar panels, fighting to increase the fixed charges that people pay for electricity. So regardless if you use it, you still pay for network access. And we can see a whole lot of that going on with the incumbent players, and it's not because of the blockchain. Mm -hmm. um, flight means do nothing, pretend it's not happening, or divest. And we're starting to see big utilities hive, separate their assets into old energies and new energies and sell those off. And there's um, a lot of them have already taken a big haircut in value. In Europe, like nearly half a trillion dollars has been wiped off the value of a lot of these companies and their credit ratings have been downgraded significantly because of the market outlook for those um, traditional generators not being very positive. And it would be very hard to get finance for like a large coal-fired power station in a developed country now. Yeah. So um, flight is either do nothing or divest. And we're seeing that happening. And the final one is innovate. And that is where you might start offering solar panels to your customers or batteries. And we're seeing the incumbent players do that. Or offering customers tools to reduce their electricity in their home, like apps on their phone or notification systems. So they're actually cannibalizing their existing market. But they're doing that because if they don't, somebody else will. And so they recognize that we're being disrupted. We've got to be part of what's the new, what are the new commercial, it's not about just the technology, the solar panels or batteries. It's about the commercial models and the governance models that will underpin this new marketplace as much as it is the product. And Kodak actually didn't see that for themselves. They invented the technology behind the digital camera. They'd registered hundreds of patent patents. They'd estimated the size of the market to be $200 billion. And yet they filed for you know, bankruptcy in 2011. And they did that because they thought they were going to get a slice of the action of every photograph that was taken, which was the business model behind um, film cameras. Yeah. But the business model behind digital cameras is completely different. It's about accessories. It's about apps. It's about printing books and things like that. Yeah. And they hadn't appreciated that. So it's not just, I'll sell solar panels. It's understanding what are the other things that are going to make the experience for the customer better? And so I think that electricity market's turning on its axis, both in terms of it being distributed, but also becoming customer centric. It used to be generator centric. Yeah. And so I think that in terms of disruption, that the utilities are well aware of this. And they also, in wanting to become customer centric, they're aware that customers want to trade peer to peer. And so I think they're actually quite interested in technologies like power ledgers because it means that they can give customers what they want mm -hmm. and they're less likely to leave. And over in Perth, we only have one retailer, but over on the East Coast, it's a full retail contestable market. And what that means is there's dozens of retailers and customer churn is very expensive for the retailers. There's about 30% churn per annum and they spend a great deal of money on customer acquisition and retention. And if they can give their customers what they want, they can create a more sticky relationship with them in the bigger sense of the word. And so in terms of PowerLedger's platform, uh, energy retailers are called application hosts on our platform. So they decide to allow their customers to trade peer to peer and they need power tokens to do that. And, um, and that's part of the way we designed the system okay. so that um, they are partners in what, in, in I think managing the disruption of electricity markets without as much, disrupt, uh, without as much mm. destruction of value. Yeah, okay. Um, so do you think the power the retailers could do it themselves, or the generators, you know, in the terms of like Synergy and WA that's a generator and a retailer? Uh, yes and no. I think that many of them may want to have uh, maybe a unique offering of 
peer-to-peer. -peer. Okay. But actually, if you want to create a sophisticated electricity market, all of the market participants need to do that. And it needs to be interoperable. And what that means is that customers with different retailers are able to trade. And that's where you're going to really get the proper efficiencies that we need in the electricity market to drive the cost down because we have the highest cost of electricity in Australia. Uh, there's been, even though we've got uh, competition in the market, the way that the market rewards behaviour has created a lot of perverse outcomes. And um, we, to really solve those and create a resilient, low cost and low carbon electricity system, we're going to need to create a proper market and that doesn't mean little monopolies. Mm. So you mentioned blockchain a few times. So we were talking about looking at the problem to start with and then looking for potentially a solution that you could do it. So when you were doing some research and you came across uh, you know, the blockchain, which you know was steeped in, I guess, uh, cryptocurrency and, and Bitcoin to start with, which you know started off in the dark web and those kind of things. How did you handle the the technology side of things against the potential uh, perception around um, cryptocurrency and Bitcoin as well for part of that solution? Yeah, so it's a great question, and it's changed from what we did initially to perhaps how we're working now. So when we first started operating, most of the utilities had never heard of the blockchain. And so there was a lot of conversation around building people's understanding around that. Now when we talk to them, there's a lot of people in the organisations that are across the technology and understand its application for electricity markets. So it's a much faster conversation. The cryptocurrency thing is probably at the same point as maybe a year ago with the blockchain. Mm. So they're curious but nervous about it. And there's, you know, there's so much talk around the speculation in the cryptocurrency market and talk that it's a bubble and it may well be, uh, but I would liken it to the tech stock boom of the millennium. <laughs> you know, there were a lot of value was ascribed to companies during that period based on speculation around what those companies would do in the future. And there came a point where the market no longer accepted ideas but wanted to see progress. And I think that a lot of value in uh, in different uh, you know, coins or tokens, as it were, is based on speculation around future performance. But I think the market will begin to um, discern, you know, the wood, the char from the yeah. uh, the wheat very soon. And that, like tech stock, even though there was a bubble, it's not like technology disappeared. That just the bona fide players were left at the end. So I think that it will take. A bit like the is it was it the four minute mile that got cracked that year? I think six or seven people did it immediately afterwards, and it'll probably be like that with the first ones dipping their toe in the cryptocurrency waters, mm. and then I think we'll see more widespread adoption. Yeah, good. Um, so when you went okay, so we're we're looking at uh, blockchain and and a bit of crypto on the side. Who came up with the idea of doing an ICO? And I, think, I think you sent me a message on LinkedIn. <laughs> ah! <laughs> Touche. <laughs> uh, we were watching the ICO market and seeing what was happening, and we were looking at it going, there's so much vaporware out there with companies that ha don't have a platform, don't have applications, certainly don't have any projects. And we were like, we are just a little company from Perth, but we have those things, and the electricity space hadn't really been uh, tested. And so and we were cognizant of other market participants, but we didn't get the sense that they were really maybe about to do it. And we thought we should really consider this. Uh, and we looked at how do we design the platform in such a way that it actually is, it could be a dis distributed or and a decentralized um, marketplace. And the way we designed the power token was to enable that. Um, because the more market participants and the more intermediaries you've got, the more costs. And the power token basically acts in a similar way to an investment bank. When uh, you pre-sell something to a customer, and in this case it's um, electricity, like Sparks, which is a cryptographic token, which is a tokenized unit of electricity. So think phone minutes. When your company, your phone company sells you phone minutes, they're pre-selling you something that you haven't used yet. And if you want to redeem those back to dollars, um, the, you need to trust that the phone company will do that. And the way banks manage merchant payment facilities when they allow you to take payments is they get you to put up collateral 
on the side in the event that you don't repay those customers for their phone minutes. The bank's got money on collateral to make sure that those customers are not left you know, holding the can. And so the power token effectively does the same thing. An application host, so an energy company, allows their customers to trade peer-to-peer, -peer, and they do that by allowing them to buy Sparks and trade them. So the application host sells Sparks to its customers, and one Spark is one cent, or the lowest denomination in a particular currency. So in Japan, it would be one yen. And um, so I would buy a dollar's worth of Sparks, and I'd get 100 Sparks. And then you're, selling, you're generating electricity, and I purchase it. So I send my Sparks to your wallet, and you want to get dollars for them. And so you go to the application host and give them 100 Sparks, and they give you a dollar. What happens if that application host, you know, doesn't honour that agreement? The power token is what the application host requires yeah. and puts it in a bond in the event of default. Mm. And so it's the way the system maintains its integrity and the way the system self-regulates. Mm. Very good. Um, so the ICO. Yes. So we saw. <laughs> yeah. It, so we saw what was going on, and we thought, well, why don't we give it a go? Yeah. Basically. Yep. Cool. I'm getting a, a feeling there's a bit of a habit forming with these kind of things. Fair. Yeah. <laughs> um, so what was that like as a ride? Because it's, you know, what was reported was, you know, $34 million in two weeks. Um, that's a wild ride. Yeah, it wasn't quite two weeks. So we had the main sale, which was four weeks. And then before that, we had the pre-sale, which was about four days. Yeah, yeah, and I think there was a gap between them of a couple of weeks. Mm. Yeah, a couple of days. Yeah. A couple of days. Oh, yeah, it was uh, not long. So m maybe six weeks. So six weeks. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it was the most intense experience of my life. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Mm. And uh, you had one baby. Yeah. And you're going to have another one. Yeah. And it's still the most intense. By an order of magnitude. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that was a walk in the park. By <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, in at JP Morgan, I worked in on lots of deals, like listing companies on mm. stock exchanges, and it's a very intense kind of boiler room experience as you go on a roadshow and get people to invest money in and um, build the prospectus and the listing docs and prepare the management team. And it's a very confined space of time and you're working very crazy hours. And so I thought it would be like that, but it was like that plus like another world because you're dealing with purchases, not just five or six institutional investors, you're dealing with 15,000 people. And um, we had a telegram group, which we still have. I don't know, how many people are in there? Like 16,000. Mm. There's 16,000 now in there. And um, uh, the four weeks of the main sale um, was like an eternity because we actually didn't price the token in the main sale. It was determined by like what's called a volume weighted average price. Yep. So the amount of dollars pledged divided by the amount of tokens determine the final price. But if you think about what that means is that when there's a small amount of money in there, in the first week, the token price is very small. And then as more money comes in, the token price goes up, but no one knows where you're gonna to get to. And the pre-sale was a fixed price and it was 8.8 .8 cents. <laughs> and um, Many people in the main, the pre-sale were very angry in, for the, the first three weeks of the main sale because the price was lower than that up until a certain point. And um, they started making like think, death threats and, uh, uh, and yeah, writing crazy messages to me. And uh, I, we had to really defend what we were doing and the process that we were taking. And I remember at one point, one evening, we made some changes in terms of, we, we, we talked about a soft cap in terms of uh, what we needed to achieve our ambitions. And um, some people had reacted very strongly to this. And I remember sitting on the bathroom floor uh, at my house on Telegram for nine hours straight. And like my husband was like, what are you doing in there? Um, and I was just basically trying to say, please everyone, could you wait rather than prejudge what the outcome's gonna be and actually undermine the sale and it was a very um, intense process and we were we finished very strong and the mm. main sale price exceeded that of the pre-sale and subsequently trading on the secondary market was very strong. So all of those concerns were dissipated and everyone got so excited at the end but that process in the middle was very, very intense and stressful uh, and a lot of people look at other ICOs mm. and go when they sell out in seven seconds and things like that. And you think that just happens, but actually it doesn't. Mm -hmm. What's going on in the background and prior to the ICO 
is many different um, roadshows happening to market the product. And um, we, we weren't perhaps as cognizant about how that, that worked until we started the process. And so we were doing a lot of that during the ICO. Uh, so we didn't quite know what our position was until towards the end as well. Mm -hmm. But I think ultimately the thing that drove me in that process was that I believed in what we were doing. And when those people were, you know, making threats to me and being really like vile, I actually, you know, felt some very strong expletives towards them and went, I'll show you. And, uh, <laughs> and so that was a big driver going, I, I know what we've done is actually good, good and what, how we're going about it is good. So I, I didn't get many, got a couple of apologies at the end. <laughs> <laughs> All you need is one. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I can only imagine what it's like because I, I know I open up Telegram in the morning and look at the channels that I'm following and the amount of messages that are in there, but being on the other side of that <laughs> would just be, especially in the bathroom on the floor. Yeah, I mean, for, I think- For it, nine hours straight. Me, Megan was, you know, pretty much 20 hours a day for like four weeks in that chat room. Yeah, yeah cool. Um, so you've got your money, got your business, got your problem. So why don't we talk a little about some of the real world projects that are actually starting to happen now. Certainly. So where you're translating all of this into sure. solving that problem. Sure. Uh, so during the ICO, we announced um, a deal with Origin Energy, which is the largest electricity retailer in Australia. They've got 4.3 million customers. And that was to, to show how the blockchain could integrate with their platform and their electricity market. Uh, we concluded that successfully and we'll be saying more about that soon. We also announced a project in India and one in Thailand. The Thailand one involves a number of buildings that have renewables with trading between them across the regulated network and that's progressing well. And we announced, I think last week, some more additions to that. Uh, in India, we announced a partnership with Tech Mahindra, which is a um, $4 billion technology company uh, to do microgrid projects with them there. And uh, that's progressing well. And then also we announced a deal with a US company uh, about a week and a half ago Help called Help Answers and they've got a large pipeline of projects in the US so we're very excited to be working with them. We've also got a European partner, uh, we're working on a number of projects there and there's lots of others in the pipeline but I, get, I guess the overarching message is that and our focus as a company is to increase the utility of the power token and that is a function of application hosts and customers trading peer-to-peer. -peer. So the more application hosts that we have and the more customers that are trading peer-to-peer, -peer, the greater volume of power tokens that will be required to be put in escrow, which will constrain the supply of power tokens and ultimately determine the price. And I think that the message around you know, the tech stock boom, the yeah. fundamentals behind the power mm. token is that. Yeah. And so that's really the focus of us, our, our work. And we're also, so inside of that, within the next 18 months, we expect to have 12 more international projects going, hundreds of megawatts of electricity being traded daily, and also the launch of our asset germination product, which um, is using the blockchain to fractionalize um, uh, access to the income from renewable energy assets. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah, so, so that, will be an, that will be launched this year. Cool. So you're starting to see other competitors yes. try and attack the market as well? Yes, yes. Um, so how are you seeing, based on your learnings that you went through, how are you seeing what they're doing? And then providing you know they get traction, what's the interoperability play potential further down the line as well? Well, I think that the, firstly, I think it's great that there's other competitors out there because the level of literacy around the market is quite low. And the more people there are speaking about this, and uh, the more normalised it becomes, the greater the potential for mainstream uptake. Uh, there, are, there are a number of other companies that are in the space, I think probably about 10 at this stage. They, some of them are doing ICOs. They've got different approaches, like one company is about disrupting the retailers, and they've got a piece of hardware that they're using, whereas ours is software only, and we connect to the smart meters, and we partner with them. So I think they've got a slightly different approach. And another company um, did an ICO recently, but I think that they will focus more on the large institutional buyers rather than the small buyers, whereas our, our mission as a company is the democratization of power and the enablement of citizen utilities. And I think that's something that people really relate to. 
they do want like energy's become a very personal thing for many people and the thing that surprised me most during the ICO was with those 15,000 buyers of the power token so many of them approached us and said look you know I'm in France I'll translate your white paper into French and <laughs> uh, I know people in the energy sector there and they've introduced us to them and they like that whole the community power mm. and democratization of power message so uh, I think that some of the other players I've seen aren't pushing that it's more about the token as a trading like as a thing to make money out of just the coin itself and um, so I think that that more of the speculative investors in crypto have perhaps been interested in some of those companies but I mean I I am just really focused on the fundamentals behind power mm, fantastic um, so let's talk about some of the uh, the awards and the accolades and the cool things that you've been through over the last six months because yes. it's been a bit of a whirlwind yes um, so at what point, I guess, getting that, uh, apart from the ICO and, and the business and the, and the mission and the values and those kind of things that you're, you're looking to achieve, at what point did you start to think, oh, hang on a minute, everybody's starting to take notice here? Um, I think it's when I could no longer look after my LinkedIn. Uh, <laughs> that was uh -huh. me, Megan you were talking to. No, I, I had like about 3,000 contacts on LinkedIn and after the ICO I had 12,000. And um, it, I just, I, it was overwhelming and I was having all these companies saying, I want to do an ICO, will you be an advisor, will you help us? And it was just, to, to, I just realised that, um, that we had taken a leap as a company uh, and uh, that I couldn't just do. I'm lucky. We're lucky we had all these resources to hire people because we absolutely needed them yeah. um, to be able to fulfil on the mission and also expand into the markets where opportunities were presenting themselves to us. So, uh, I mean, I'm still stunned about what we've accomplished in like less. We've only been around for less than two years, but uh, I mean, I don't. I think that you know the the market. It, we haven't we're creating a market but it's not created yet and and it's not until that um, we actually you know I think we've just managed to stop at a gas station and pick up some petrol that's really all we've done I think it's not worth getting carried away with what we've accomplished here the mission is the democratization of power so I think see if you can get me in your diary in the next couple of years and we'll check in whether I've done that. <laughs> so I mean you don't get to go to Necker Island overnight though so there's a bunch of things that lead up to that. Well, so there's so I went to Necker in, in July last year, but mm. I'm going again in October, mm. and that's because of the Extreme Tech Challenge. Mm. So I went to Las Vegas in January, and we were Power Ledger was a semi finalist in the Extreme Tech Challenge, and I um, the, I pitched at the Consumer and Electronic Conference in Las Vegas, which is this crazy um, conference. It's like <laughs> two hundred thousand people at the conference, uh, uh, and there weren't that many people at the pitch, but it, we basically pitched to a panel of judges for a place in the finals and Power Ledger got into the finals. So it's the top three. Top three. And the top three get to go to Necker Island, Sir Richard Branson's Island in October to pitch mm -hmm. to him and he'll decide the winner. Mm -hmm. And you get endorsement obviously from the Virgin um, brand and also Sir Richard and help in mobilising your technology across the world. So it's a very big opportunity and speaking to previous winners, it's had a big and profound impact on their trajectory. Mm. Uh, but uh, I went also in July last year, invited by Bill Tai, who has since become a global ambassador and advisor to Power Ledger. And I met him through Curtin University, actually. He's an adjunct um, professor of innovation. And uh, uh, I basically talked to him about Power Ledger when we just set up the company. And he was really interested. And then when we started talking about doing an ICO, I asked him if he'd come on as an advisor. And he said he's never been involved in any ICOs. <laughs> and he's only ever looked at Bitcoin, but he, we're the first one he would consider doing it for. Um, so that was pretty flattering. And then he um, managed to, yeah, when he, all, he and Sir Richard set up this blockchain conference on Necker Island and they had the third one last year. And I was lucky enough to get a place last minute because someone pulled out. Um, uh, the head of uh, Virgin Galactic pulled out. <laughs> and um, so I took me and my 18-month-old daughter 37 hours and four flights 
to Necker Island. <laughs> uh, it was pretty crazy, uh, but it was an amazing experience because it, it's around the blockchain for social good and social impact. And there were 50 other practitioners that are doing really extraordinary stuff. And there was a big network of support that emerged out of that help with our ICO as well. So yeah, it was a big honor to be invited and it's had a, like Bill has had a very big uh, impact mm. uh, on the, the fortunes of the company. Yeah. And do you all know, have heard of Bill Tai? Comes out once a year, twice a year, depending on how good the, the wind is. Yeah. Uh, to uh, to start something that we have with the West Tech Fest as well. So he's found so, he founded West Tech Fest. Yep. He's a big. Was it him and Larry together? Yeah. Or? Yep. Yeah. yeah. He and Larry co-founded yep. it, and he's a serial venture capitalist. He's invested in about a hundred companies, including Twitter and um, and others. And um, he came out to Perth to do kite surfing and thought, oh, we need to have a technology competition and conference here and established it. So, yeah. yeah then we have an excuse as well as going kite surfing. Correct. That's yes. it. Yes. Which, you know, which at a lot of the places around the world, these things grow from them, those embryonic kind of things go, you know what, there's some cool stuff going on. Let's go and do something. Um, so, uh, CES, 200,000 people. Where did you go after that? Uh, I came back to Perth for six days, got really sick, uh, had to go on a course of antibiotics, uh, managed to get well enough to get on a plane and flew to Davos in Switzerland for the World Economic yeah. Forum. Uh, and um, my husband and my two-year-old came on both trips with us and um, supported me, which I was very lucky. But yeah, in Davos, I, was, I gave a talk at the Global Blockchain Business Council dinner and also had a, a, trip, a panel discussion and then a fireside chat with about 100 people. Because the Global Blockchain Business Council organized events throughout the whole week at the World Economic Forum. And so I was basically talking blockchain the whole week mm. and meeting very senior people. In like, Davos is like a ski town. It's very small and all the restaurants and bars and cafes are all co-opted by a business or a country and turned into kind of an, a venue where they have talks and functions. And so the whole street is lined with all these brand names, but it means that if you go to the functions, you get to meet the chief executive officer, the chairman and things like this. So it was a really great opportunity or like, you know, the, the energy minister for Kenya and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So it was fantastic to meet these kinds of people. And um, we're now following up with many of those people that I managed to get introduced to for opportunities for projects. Very good. So it's, it really is going global from Perth. Uh, yes. Very good. So mentioning Perth. Um, so one thing I wanted to come back to is, is I've had this, I've been back in Perth about eight or nine years after spending 10 years in Melbourne and, and London as well. Um, and I've, I've always had this vision that Perth will find its natural kind of ebb and flow and the innovation and startup and scale up ecosystem will become what we make of it. Mm -hmm. based on the projects that are happening here. Uh, and I think in the early days, a lot of people were like, we have to be like Silicon Valley or we have to be like Israel. Um, and it was always about, we have to be somewhere else rather than be here. So I just want to kind of explore your desire to become a counsellor as well for Perth and coming back to Perth and building this business in Perth as well. Now that you know, you're attracting other people uh, from around the country, and internationally to actually move to Perth to, to come and work with Power Ledger. Yeah, I went and lived in London because I just thought that's where all the big opportunities were and it was quite true to a certain, you know, certain extent in the field of finance. But if you look at where new marketplaces are created, there is a financial hub attached to them and um, there's pools of capital. And I saw that very obviously as a part of the ICO. And I think that's something that Perth's lacking. And I personally believe that Perth could pitch itself as a hub in the Asian market for digital and alternative financial markets. Uh, and no cities have really claimed that space yet, and it might not be where the existing and incumbent players are based uh, for a few reasons. One, they're very expensive. Perth's affordable and very high quality. Most of these companies are full of millennials that want to work in a very livable city. And the big players are also looking at you know alternative places to base people because of the cost and it's not just the cost of office space it's the cost of living and the salaries they have to pay people as a result of that so as an example in singapore i think it's nearly eighty thousand dollars to be able to buy a car just with taxes you can't use the public school system so if you've got two kids that's fifty thousand dollars a year you need for private school before tax uh, 
that. Whereas if you have expats here, they can use the state school system. So I think we've got a lot to offer, both in terms of being high quality and affordable. And there's probably not that much we need to do to um, start an ecosystem like that. I think it's about branding and marketing and positioning. Also dealing with visas to make sure that we can bring people in. Because the visas, a bit like you know, when I left school, blockchain wasn't invented. The lists for the state visas and the federal visas didn't contemplate a lot of the professions. And so we do need to um, refresh those to make sure that we can bring in some talent and build up our own um, capacity within the marketplace here. But we need those experts to come in to start off with. Uh, and so it's, and it's probably a matter of attracting a few uh, players in. So anchor tenants, like you would in a shopping centre, you get in your Coles or your Woolworths and then you build around it. It's the same, I think, with a couple of the big and established players to, to see what we can do to bring them to Perth. Yep. Uh, because we are you know, in 60% of the world's time zone. We've got direct flights to London. We're about mm. to get direct flights to Tokyo, Shanghai. It's a great place to live. So I think that there's a lot to offer. Um, and yeah, I would like to see that happen. And the mission, the thing I was really attracted to council was because I wanted to see what we could do by way of economic diversification because I don't want my daughter to get to 20 and go, I have to leave for 11 years to seek best opportunities. Mm. Cool. I think we're done. We're almost, we are, five minutes done. Well done. Um, has anyone got a quick question for Gemma? We do have networking afterwards as well. So you all seem to get into that pretty quick and easy when we started. So just a couple of quick questions. Yep. Gemma, if you... Oh, we're unfortunate enough to miss out on the ICO, the power of <laughs> still some way that we can get involved with the fantastic work that you're doing? Yeah, um, actually the power token is trading on, I think, on about eight or nine exchanges. So um, it's possible to purchase power tokens. And then also if you've got projects, um, property development projects, um, solar farms, things like that, we'd be very interested to chat. Somebody tweeted the uh, the billboard in Melbourne. Uh, I saw that with the Telstra. With the Telstra billboard. So there's a billboard in Melbourne that's digital that yeah. you can tweet and it puts your message up. Somebody tweeted, I love power, as in P-O-W-R. Yeah. So you know you've made it. So <laughs> Telstra's probably sitting there going, someone spelt it wrong. Yeah. Do, we, do we update it? <laughs> Tracy? Uh, Gemma, I'm, I'm struck by the fact that you went into venture capital, which is a very male-dominated field. You went into energy, which is a more male-dominated field, arguably. Entrepreneurship, we know, is also very male-dominated, particularly in the tech field. Have you seen anything particularly unusual about you or your company that's allowed you to make move into this space consistently, where I'm presuming often you might be the only female in the space? Well, uh, at the Blockchain Summit in NECA, there were 50% women and men. And it was the first tech conference I've been to uh, when, uh, when that I'd seen that. And it wasn't like you were getting the B team. Uh, and so, uh, obviously myself is um, <laughs> slightly conflicted on that. But um, I, just think, I just think that um, there are actually a surprising amount of women in blockchain. And there's been a few articles written about them as well online. Like I think it might be a Forbes article of like 200 female speakers if you want um, someone in tech. Not maybe as well known, but I, I think that uh, the profile of women in tech is uh, being elevated, and just more generally, I've noticed. You know, when I can't speak at a conference, sometimes I'll say, "Oh, I can send one of my other co-founders, who's a man," and they're like, "No, we want a woman." And um, <laughs> suddenly, it's become unacceptable not to have made the effort to try and get some women on the panel and the speaking lineup and whatnot. So I think it's just more spotlight on it, um, which is a good thing, but. I think it's a field, like, I think of the blockchain like a relational database, and that's like quite systemic thinking, and if you look at how men and women tend to fall into certain professions, uh, risk management and systemic thinking is something that is naturally lends itself to, to women from, not in all instances, but if you look at normal distribution curves and whatnot, so I think it's a profession that actually lends itself very well to bringing more women into tech. One more question. Uh, just a quick one. Um, are you ever concerned about the single point of failure being you're building everything on top of the Ethereum layer and that maybe there is a potential for third generation cryptos and is there something that Power Ledger is doing to you know, develop on other blockchains? 
yeah, that's the holy grail. So it, <laughs> most most blockchain companies that have a pro like that a need for scale uh, and fast block times and small micro transactions, they're all doing this right now, looking at what is the blockchain that's going to be fit for purpose for that reason. And there's so much effort going into it. Uh, and we already have identified a short list of potential candidates. So it's actually something that hasn't been ubiquitously solved yet, but I'm very confident that it will. Okay, all right, we're done. Thanks, Andy. Can I put your hands together to thank Gemma? I think she's absolutely smashed it out of the park. Thanks. Uh, for, a first, uh, for a first regard, is that gonna come back on? If we move out of this. A couple of things I just wanted to take you through around uh, start up grind. So uh, did anybody, if you're on the Facebook group or Twitter or we're getting all the socials up and running for Perth, uh, the global conference was just on. Uh, there was a live feed. Did anyone have a look at the live feed apart from me? Cool, that's why we've got good bandwidth in Australia. Um, these are some of the speakers that uh, have spoken at Startup Grind events around the world. Okay, uh, Reid Hoffman, LinkedIn, Cal from Slack, uh, Gillian from Booking.com, uh, Guy from Canva, um, uh, who else is here? Oh, James from Fitbit as well. So uh, Gemma's in esteemed company now. Um, I think it's really interesting because the, the whole gender balance thing, when you look through these, it is, it's probably 50-50. And I think it's fantastic. And I remember when I started uh, my previous business, more than 50% of the businesses we invested in were female founders. The co-working space ended up being about 50-50 with male and female as well. Um, and I think it is that, it is starting to move in that direction. Um, our sponsors, uh, EY, Tankstream Labs, which will be open very soon in here. So this will become uh, a new co-working space. So Tankstream Labs is based out of Sydney uh, and Chapter One Advisors are helping us with, uh, with some PR as well. Uh, so our next speaker, uh, anyone know Shahira? Perth lady, yeah, body. <laughs> uh, so Shahira is Perth girl, her and her husband Toby founded a business called Finch. This is some of what they've done in 18 months. So, you know, and this is the reason I asked Shahira to come back because there's real skin in the game with this, right? So she sold her apartment in San Fran to fund this business. Um, first international startup selected at the number one fintech program in the US, so Yodely. Uh, won the best product demo at the, uh, at the Yodely program. Um, they now live in Melbourne as well, by the way. Uh, first fintech to receive anti-money laundering exemption from Austrac. Uh, they beta tested at University of Melbourne and Sydney, so again, going back and testing the market. Um, they completed a case study with over 500 students at five universities. This is the bit I liked. In three months, they closed a two and a quarter million dollar, what they call seed round. What we call Series A generally in Australia is a million dollars. So they close that. So I think, and this is, there's a lot of work that goes into that. You don't just pick up the phone and go, this is what I need to do. So I think it's a really interesting story around how we can start to break down borders, how you put some skin in the game uh, and go through all of that, and then a bit of press in there as well. So it's approximately the 14th of March. Uh, it'll be an evening event, because we want to mix them up a little bit as well. Uh, so we want, you know, so that some people can get to lunchtime things, some people can get to evening things. Uh, it'll all go out through all the social channels, um, so sign up and get connected. Uh, and then the final thing is once all the roof has been ripped out of here and it's all been painted black or there's some plastic plants and cool funky startup stuff in here, um, everybody's invited to the, the Tank Stream Labs Perth Hub launch on the 1st of March. All right, and we'll send that out as well. So you'll all get a, an email through the, the Startup Grind website. All right, so thank you all for your support. Thank you everyone that's been involved in getting this grind of a thing going. Um, uh, can you please just uh, put your hands together one last time for Gemma? Thank you. <laughs> you got there. You got there. Uh, and so now uh, the sec or the third part of a startup grind event is more networking. So I think uh, the uh, the drinks we're going to get refreshed. We're here till two thirty as well. 
So uh, make some friends, not contacts. Don't just go and hit everyone up on LinkedIn and don't put anything in. Don't do it with Gemma because Megan won't respond to you anymore. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but make yourselves at home and thank you very much oh, as well. We've got 10 Power Ledger t-shirts. Oh. Um, you got a medium? You one, just come up to Megan and it's first come, uh, best dress. Oh, best dress, I love it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, Gemma. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Oh.